Hello and good evening. Uh, we are broadcasting this from Casa Miranda in London, the house where General Miranda lived and where he and General Bolivar uh, met to discuss the liberation of the continent. It's appropriate that we're here today because we're going to discuss what happened in Honduras, a country not much discussed in the mainstream media, but even in the sort of liberal and vaguely sympathetic sections of press and television, because it's relatively speaking a small country, its troubles have been ignored. Just to remind viewers that the elected president was toppled in 2009 by a coup d'etat organized by the United States and its local relays, which is the army and the oligarchy. And so they went the traditional route, a military coup d'etat. And much of this history might have been forgotten or might have been resuscitated later. Were it not for a remarkable documentary by the young filmmaker Jesse Freeston. It didn't have to come to this. Six months earlier, the president of the Republic, Manuel Celaya, promised the Iguan campesinos to help them get their land back. He told them that under a new constitution, they could enshrine their right to land. Three weeks later, he was kidnapped by the military, a coup d'etat. These Honduran soldiers surround the presidential palace with one mission, to arrest their president. And they succeeded. Manuel Zelaya was taken into military custody and whisked away to an Air Force base on the outskirts of the capital. The president of Honduras says he's the victim of a coup. He says he was brutally kidnapped by soldiers. The coup was carried out on the very day Hondurans were supposed to be voting on a referendum to write a new constitution. A popular uprising began immediately. I was convinced the resistance was going to reverse the coup. It was four months in, and not a single country in the world had officially recognized the regime of Roberto Micheletti. His justification for his actions was falling flat in even the most friendly of places. How do you change the Honduras Constitution? You cannot change the Constitution ever? of Honduras, ever, ever. There's because no way to amend it. The way I says we have a, a coup, a military coup, and a, it's not true. We are in the power, the civilian, we are in power. Are we going to go to the election the 29th of November? There was no election campaign. All the major international observers refused to participate. And the same military that overthrew the elected president five months earlier was in charge of transporting the ballot boxes. Porfirio Lobo has been elected the new president of Honduras. Most Latin American governments denounced the elections as fraudulent, while Western media and governments moved quickly to legitimize the new face of the coup. International aid that had been suspended was restored, and it looked like the resistance was defeated. Less than two weeks later, news arrived that Miguel Facuse's palm oil plantations had been taken over. Before we show you some of the footage from this film, I have talking to me on Skype from the other end of the world, Jesse Freeston. Hey, nice to be here. Basically, the film uh, covers these communities in, in the Iguan Valley um, and who respond to the coup by taking over the plantations of the most powerful man in the country, Miguel Facuse. And when the moment when they took over the plantations was at a really low moment, uh, five, mi five months after the coup. Esta recuperación es una recuperación que hace tiempo se hubiera hecho. Y hoy pues, tanto tiempo que tenemos de estar en lucha, ya creemos que se llegó el momento de que esto se haga. December 9, 2009, the Unified Campesino Movement of the Iguan, MUCA, 
takes over the plantations of the richest man in Honduras, Miguel Facuse. Campesinos are agricultural workers, the people that work the land. And on this night, in a span of a few minutes, 2,000 campesino families go from being landless to controlling 4,000 hectares of the most fertile land in all of Central America. Ahora cada campesino es una escuela. Ahora cada persona puede hacer un análisis, lo que antes no podía hacerlo. Porque ahora la gente ya reflexiona y acciona y piensa. Nosotros antes éramos Vicente, ¿de dónde va? ¿Dónde va toda la gente? Ahora no, ahora es cada uno de nosotros. Por muy humilde que nos miremos, somos una escuela. Yo de ser campesina, ni hoy ni nunca me arrepiento. El mejor regalo que le hizo Dios al hombre fue la tierra. Pero dijo Dios al hombre, doy la tierra a todos los seres humanos, no solo a unos poquitos, como ahora la tienen unos cuatro pelones en nuestro país, que dicen que hay paz, aquí en Honduras no hay paz, y yo creo que mientras no haya tierra, nunca va a haber paz, hasta aquí mi participación. One of the things that impressed me the most, apart from various other segments of the film, is that the women you interviewed, right at the top of the film, the courage, the defiance of the Jutekem, and spoke their minds, and said, you know, this is our political consciousness. We are political. The film covers four years of the story of the resistance to the coup, beginning with the coup itself and, and up until the elections of 2013, and that four-year process in between. And I think there's, to, to be able to understand how politicized the everyday person got in Honduras, you have to understand two things. One is that the coup happened on the day that they were going to be voting for the first time in the history of the country on something other than the name of their leader, whether it be the mayor or whether it be the president or a member of Congress. They were voting on whether or not they wanted to rewrite the Constitution. And in that process, people started to think about, okay, well, what would I like in a new Constitution? What would serve my needs? And you saw various sectors of the population get really organized. Then what the coup did was it brought all those sectors that had started thinking about their interests and started thinking about what they wanted to see in a new Constitution. It brought all of them under the same you know, uh, roof for the same time, in the, for the first time in the history of the country. And so they learned from each other. And we saw uh, feminists from the city talking to campesinas, to landless farmers from the country for the first time. And we saw all these, this uh, dissemination of ideas in the same physical space. You had these national assemblies, which are depicted in the film. We had representatives from every part of the country and every, every different kind of identity you could imagine. So it's the combination of the project of rewriting the constitution and how that gets everybody in the country thinking broadly. And then also the project of the coup to try and to destroy that, that dream of a new constitution actually brought people physically under the same roof. Jesse. Of the fact that you're a gringo didn't have any adverse effects on the people you were interviewing. They asked who you were and all that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm not just am I, am I a gringo. Physically, I, I look like a Viking. So in, in Central America, it's pretty clear that I'm, uh, that I'm a foreigner. The moment when they took over the plantations was at a really low moment, uh, five, mi five months after the coup. Uh, and, and we really, were, those of us who were in the capital and in San Pedro Sula, the second biggest city, were kind of thinking, okay, well, it sounds like the, the resistance is now going to you know, dissipate in some way. So I went there immediately, and it turned out that I was the first uh, journalist to get there, um, either national or international. And they were really excited to see me, I think, because it, it, it provided a sense of security for them. And I think, um, you know, with me being there, uh, it's an unfortunate thing and it's, 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 a, it's a, a, an example of global racism and one of the things we need to fight against that if a Honduran farmer gets killed, it's not going to make the news, but if a Canadian journalist gets killed, that's a big deal. So they're aware of that, like, you, like we were talking about, their political consciousness is very high. They understand that, that, I'm, that I'm a form of security for them.
por cuidarles la espalda a los que están dentro. Hacemos lo necesario de cuidarlos como hermanos y protegerlos pues, de unos a otros, cuidarlos. Sí. Y es el, lo, la obligación de vigilante en el portón. Y es lo que nosotros vamos buscando, la hermandad. Es lo que vamos buscando nosotros, el, el compañerismo. Entonces, por eso nosotros hemos sentido un cambio libre, pues, libre. Estamos aquí donde vamos a hacer un building eh, como una comercial campesina eh, donde vamos a poder vender bicicletas, ropa, eh, vender lo que nosotros producimos pues eh, para no estar comprando a las grandes empresas como a las transnacionales. Lo que estamos haciendo aquí es, eh, estamos haciendo autosostenibles. Whether it's the fish farm, the water tower or the chicken coop, all these projects are built by MUCA members and financed by the sale of the palm fruit. Aquí se va a instalar también en futuro una radio, una radio campesina que va a ser también del pueblo, eh, donde vamos a poder eh, expresarlo, la libre expresión y decir lo que nosotros sentimos y lo que queremos a futuro para nuestro departamento. With so much activity in the new communities, I sometimes forget about the constant threat of violence they live under, but never for very long, because roughly every two weeks, heavily armed men in civilian clothing arrive on motorcycles or in pickup trucks and kill a member of MUCA. These hitmen are often talked about, but rarely seen. What's not rare to see, though, are the consequences of their attacks. This funeral is for Adonis Lopez. Like all campesino murders, there's no sign of a police investigation and no charges are laid. <laughs> so in effect, uh, your film is, a, of course, the largest chunk is the people. What they think, what they say, how they fight, their hopes. But you also show the ugly face of the oligarchy and behind them, the military. El empresario Miguel Facusé fue galardonado por la Asociación Nacional de Industriales Andy durante el tercer congreso industrial que realiza el sector privado en un hotel capitalino. Necesitamos del capital extranjero para que venga, pero estos asuntos como están sucediendo en el Aguán, donde están robando, eh, robando las iniciativas privadas al sector de inversiones, le da mal espina. Honduras is open for business a conference organized by the regime to attract international investors. Speakers include the richest man in the world, Carlos Slim, former Colombian President Alvaro Uribe, and U.S. Ambassador to Honduras, Hugo Llorens. Miguel Facuse's Dynant Corporation is also present. The whole thing feels like a party in celebration of a successful coup d'etat. <laughs> Les hemos dicho que el Congreso decidió hace dos días que los proyectos arriba de 20 millones de dólares que pudieran requerir urgencia de atender de parte del Estado en términos de su construcción pueden hacerse bajo un procedimiento rápido, un fast track, como le llaman. Si algo le estamos aportando a la clase política hondureña, no importa si es de derecha, de izquierda o como nosotros del centro, todo le estamos apostando a la inversión porque eso significa derrame social, con empleos, con más oportunidades. Muchas gracias a ustedes por acompañarnos en este evento. Ahora Honduras está naciendo de nuevo y todos somos parte de eso. Gracias. Está defendiendo la venta del territorio nacional. Allá está tomando videos aquí el policía para después ir a asesinar gente. Mire. 
Estamos conscientes que se está poniendo en venta nuestro país. Inversionistas multimillonarios extranjeros que van a venir acá simplemente a decir qué pueden hacer y deshacer y dejándonos a nosotros a un lado. Y por eso venimos nosotros aquí a decir basta. So, was this film shown in Honduras, Jesse? We have shown the film. We've shown the film on a national television network in Honduras named Globo TV, um, which is an interesting story of the coup itself. Is that it was not a it was a radio station before the coup, actually mostly playing salsa and other music, uh, and then it just they saw this huge void that the the majority of the country was against the coup, and there was no radio station nationally that was giving that a voice. Campesinos aren't the only ones dying. The conflict has also claimed a handful of Facuses guards the lawyer who represented the campesinos in the capital, and journalist Naum Palacio. The stories and perspectives of campesinos rarely make it beyond their communities. Naum tried to change that. The day after the coup, he was arrested and tortured by the military. After he filed a human rights complaint, he was shot down along with his pregnant girlfriend. Nationally syndicated radio host Felix Molina has come to the Aguan to follow up on the case of his fellow journalist. Ahora vamos a conversar un poquito con Heriberto Palacios, es el papá de Naum. La justicia que ha hecho después de aquel asesinato. Absolutamente nada, nada. Es como una víbora que no muerde a los que calzan botas. Exactamente, son los que dan chuña. Entonces prácticamente... O sea, este coronel la justicia no, la, no, no lo va a morder. No lo va a tocar, es que no lo va a tocar definitivamente, jamás. Pero usted confía más en la capacidad de respuesta del pueblo. Claro. Claro, es que la voz del pueblo es la voz de Dios. La voz del pueblo es la voz de Dios. Pero Dios como que ha estado un poco ausente. Es que usted sabe muy bien que en este tiempo el, 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 el mundo está cruzando por unas, ¿cómo quiero decir? Por unas tribulaciones inmensas. Es, es una amiga que va a camino a Tegucigalpa desde el norte. He pasado 10 retenes y he encontrado tres camiones militares para el norte del país. ¿Y por qué? O sea, ¿qué? Uh, esto es la remilitarización de la UAN. Después que el empresario Miguel Facosé ha dado un ultimátum al movimiento campesino, que si no le pagan las tierras el 1 de junio, él va a desalojarlos. Y como que él fuera el comandante general de las Fuerzas Armadas, como que fuera el director de la policía, haciendo que el ejército y la policía vengan hacia sus tierras a la, a la hora que él se le antoja. Eso es increíble. Diez retenes en la carretera. Con la presencia de la Standard Fruit Company en los alrededores, hace que los Estados Unidos también esté de algún modo muy pendiente de la región en términos de los intereses de esa transnacional de Estados Unidos. Jesse, the coup was being prepared even as the conference of the Americas was taking place in Trinidad, if my memory serves me right. And Chavez had presented Obama with a copy of Eduardo Galeano's book, uh, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, came up to Chavez and thanked him for mentioning her husband, because Chavez had said that Bill Clinton you know, was more understanding than some other people in the United States. And all the while she was uh, smiling and cooing and thanking him, the State Department under her leadership was preparing a coup d'etat, which of course they denied. The, the question about what the State Department was doing at the time um, is interesting because WikiLeaks was the first major view into it. Um, which what showed that a week before the coup, uh, Hugo Llorens, who was the ambassador at the time to Honduras uh, from the United States, a U.S. ambassador, invited over some key oligarchs and Manuel Salaya to his house one week before the coup. And while there's not too many details about what happened in that, that interview, Salaya and others have basically pointed out that he basically said, you can't do this, you can't go ahead with this constitutional referendum. Do Hondurans want to rewrite the Constitution as part of a national constitutional assembly? But that Constitution was written inside the U.S. Embassy in 1981. And so we see the same U.S. Embassy go into action and say, you can't touch that document. 
I mean, that is, a, that, that is, a, that is untouchable. And, uh, and that is really what, what brought about the coups. To give you an example of some of the things that people were thinking about putting in the new constitution, the farmers that uh, we see in the film, they were thinking about putting in something, a limit to how much land one person could have in the country. That was one thing. Uh, um, a, a lower limit to any farmer that they, they should have access to this much cultivable land. And then also inside the constitution that the constitution of Honduras would favor the cooperative as a form of developing the countryside as opposed to the corporation. The United States and, and the oligarchs in Honduras uh, were not having it. I arrive at the occupation of El Elixir one day after they too are forced off the land. This time, the eviction was carried out by the national police. The group of 106 families is headed by Blanca Espinosa, the first woman in the history of the Iguan Valley to lead a land occupation. Nosotros ya estábamos cultivando, ya teníamos frijoles, ya teníamos maíz, pero como en eso vino el desalojo, entonces todo, todo perdimos. Dicen que fueron como de 80 a 100 policías. Y desde que entraron fue desnudando a toda la gente que estaba ahí, porque supuestamente ellos venían que nosotros estábamos armados. Y nosotros, ¿de dónde íbamos a comprar armas si nosotros que somos campesinos pobres? El día de mañana mis hijos no van a decir, mi madre fue una cobarde, que no nos dejó ni a dónde vivir. Entonces, por eso yo estoy luchando y no tengo miedo que me maten. Ellos me caminan buscando, aquí estoy. While three-quarters of the Iguan cooperatives lost or sold their land, 14 are still operating in the valley. They are workplaces where those that work the land and those that own it are one and the same, and the benefits are obvious. Today, Blanca and her friend Orbelina are off to visit the co-op of Salama. It's like visiting an alternative present, how life would be for Blanca and others if the previous generation hadn't lost the land. Es la vivienda de un campesino, ¿verdad? de un esfuerzo que se hizo hace varios años y pues hoy está descansando en una casa pues más o menos que reúne algunas condiciones. Esta casa está linda, adecuadamente. Ya no de un campesino, sino que de... No lo voy a decir por qué, porque es terrible. Pues, ya no de un, un campesino, sino que un cooperativista, un cooperativista país, bien sí. organizado. Co-op members work the same schedule as the employees of Facuse. But while Facuse provides zero benefits, co-op members have free health care, great housing with internet access, and their children have all their schooling paid for, up to and including university. Members also have an equal vote in all company decisions. Sí, aquí viene toda la comunidad a llevar su agua potable. Solo abres la llave. Y la fábrica de de Facuse o de Morales vendan ese tipo de agua. Agua nada así. No, lastimosamente. Porque más bien quisieran envenenar el agua para que no vivieran. <laughs> Ahorita en primer lugar la inversión de respiratorias agudas, un lugar para sitismo y problemas de la piel, son los lo que más se ve ahorita acá. Dengue, malaria, no, no. No, casi dengue y malaria no tenemos. Diarrea, un poco también casi no. Acá por la mejor condición de las viviendas acá, por eso pienso yo que ha disminuido el grado de malaria y de dengue también. también. Jesse. What happened during the last elections? Every serious observer suggested that they had been rigged. Um, yet the European Union monitors, barring one uh, honorable man who is shown in your film, came and just gave the green light. I mean, you compare that with how they talk about Venezuela or Ecuador or Bolivia, and here they gave a complete green light to a sort of fairly disgusting regime brought to power by undemocratic means. The official statements from the teams of both the European Union and the Organization of American States quickly declared the elections a transparent success. While many observers spoke privately of their disagreement with the official position, only one, an Austrian named Leo Gabriel, took his dissent public. Declaro que estas elecciones no fueron transparentes. ¿Qué la Unión Europea entonces se adelantó a dar este tipo de informe? ¿O es porque son demasiado alejados de la realidad los directivos? ¿O 
que hay algún propósito político como podría ser que prefieren una dictadura estable que a la democracia que podía tener el riesgo de ser un bolso. Who were these EU monitors? A lot of the election observers that you run into are, are, are very young. They're in their 20s and, and, and early 30s. And, and they're in countries in Europe now, where, um, or in the United States or Canada, where jobs are increasingly more difficult to come by. And I think at that stage in their life, when they realize that the chief of the mission has taken a position, which is very clear in the EU and very clear in the OAS, to go against that, uh, means kind of the end of your career, probably. And I think that uh, to understand this, there's a really important word that we hear on the streets in Honduras that unfortunately doesn't have a very nice English translation. And it's called golpismo. So golpe is the Spanish word for coup, from coup d'etat. And golpismo is an ideology, it's a way of thinking, and it also means it's a long-term project. So the ideology is the willing to do whatever it takes, you know, to get whatever you want. Levantemos la mano quienes estamos de acuerdo de revocar la resolución número o el acuerdo número 2 de la Asamblea General del 28 de febrero del 2011. Gracias compañeros y compañeros. Just like that, the resistance launched their electoral alarm, the Freedom and Refoundation Party, or LIBRE sending a message that the next elections will be the first ever to break with the traditional two-party system. However, at the very moment that the resistance was meeting in the capital, the powers that be used the national police to send their own message in the Aguan. How do you see the future of the country? I think the Honduran people are going to continue to organize in waves. It's going to, it's going to come and go in waves, but the, the status quo in Honduras is completely untenable. So they're, they're, and, and the people are politic too politicized now that it's just, it's going to come and go, but it's, it's going to be there. It's going to be a constant. What we don't know is whether or not the countries that have a historical and current kind of hold over power from the outside, how is the process of democratization going to, going to happen in countries like the United States, in countries like Canada and the European Union? Are we going to see these, these popular movements that are against austerity? Are they going to be able to get some control also over the foreign policy of these countries? And I think that will be the deciding factor or one of, along with the agency of the Honduran people in their own, in their own story, um, in terms of what happens in a country like Honduras. Jesse, thanks very much. Great talking to you. Uh, equally a pleasure. Thank you. ¿Qué dijo a, a sus hijos ayer que iba a hacer hoy? Yo lo solo les dije que iba este, a hacer un mandado porque no, no, uno no, no les dice a lo que viene, ¿verdad? Es la, nuestra madre la que nos da la vida, por lo tanto la tenemos que recuperar, tenemos que salvarla de, la, de las manos de los grandes terratenientes. Somos 1,500 y, y creemos que Eh, es muy poco, pero y lo importante es que los campesinos empecemos a trabajar. Estamos cansados de, 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 no, de no tener un pedazo de tierra, de no tener un proyecto para nosotros. Los ricos ellos tienen sus proyectos, ellos tienen sus palmeras, ellos tienen sus bananeras. ¿Y el campesino qué tiene? Solo hambre. <risa> 